And did you have to acquire an account for, for YouTube to do that? Uh, we have our own channel. Yeah. Oh. Okay. In 20 uh, seconds. Yeah. We are now live. <clears throat> There's a 20, 20 second uh, uh, delay from what you do on Zoom, but until it shows up on YouTube. So, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> All right, we're live on YouTube, everybody. So uh, just keep yourself muted and have your cameras off, please. <clears throat> Thank you. I think I'll take myself off as well. Okay. We'll wait a couple more minutes. We have nine people that are uh, logged in, so we'll wait uh, a couple minutes back. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the September 2nd version of NJC Connects. And we're happy to uh, have joining us today, Jeff Margolis. Uh, Jeff is uh, probably well known to many of you here in Naples. He's lectured at uh, Collier County Library, the Renaissance Academy, uh, Holocaust Museum of Southwest Florida, MCA and WCA. And we were fortunate to have uh, Jeff do a lecture at our men's club lunch last year uh, talking about books that have been written by presidents and uh, Jeff's going to have a little bit more to say about that at the end of this presentation as well. Um, he's an author, he's uh, an educator and a lecturer as you are obviously aware and today's uh, program Disney in American culture I think is going to be very interesting to all of us so without further ado uh, Jeff it's all yours. Hey. Good afternoon, and as soon as we set up the PowerPoint, uh, we'll get going. Okay, uh, where, Dick, where shall I find this? Uh, you, at the bottom, you want to share screen. Okay. And then at the top, uh, do you have your PowerPoint loaded on your computer? Yes. Okay, you should... Uh, do what you did the other day. Just click on uh, click on share screen, and your your uh, screen will come up, and just and highlight your. Uh... Hang hang on a second. No.
There you go. Okay, you can uh, you can change. Can you say there you go? You're all set to go. Everybody can see it. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, again, good afternoon, and thanks for for joining in. Um, I want to share with you some findings that I have uh, come across over the years about Disney and his relationship uh, with American culture. So we're going to take a look this afternoon as whether or not Disney is in a unique position by all of its holdings to create American middle class values. And is it something that's entertainment? Or is there something more calculating and sinister that we might want to take a, a look at? So we'll delve into a little bit of the history and then talk about what's been happening recently with Disney Company, particularly since Walt's passing back in 1966. So a number of years ago, when I was teaching at Rowan University, I had an opportunity to meet Henry Giroux. And Henry Giroux at that time was a professor uh, uh, in the Graduate School of Education at Penn State University. And he wrote this book in 1999 called The Mouse That Roared. And I have to tell you, it has nothing to do with Peter Sellers and the movie of the same name. But Giroux took an introspective look at the impact that Disney has on American culture and how it is geared toward getting children to get their parents to buy things and, and also establishing what was considered middle-class values at the time. So uh, Giroux said, Disney's become the symbol for the security and romance of the small town America of ye yesteryear, a pristine never, never land in which children's fantasies come true, happiness reigns and innocence is kept safe through the magic of pixie dust. So we're gonna take a look at that this afternoon, see if it's true and uh, hopefully you'll have some questions that we can discuss at the end of the program. So the main focus of this afternoon is Walt Elias Disney and his best known friend, Mickey Mouse. Walt was born in 1901 and passed away in 1966. Uh, he was born in Chicago, Illinois. There's a picture of Walt as a baby and his uh, parents, Clara and Elias Disney. But when Disney was very young, the family moved from Chicago to a very small town called Marceline, Missouri. And Walt always enjoyed the small town feel of Marceline, and he was particularly interested in Main Street. It, it had a feeling for him. And it's kind of interesting is that this carried with him through adulthood. And if you have ever been to Disneyland or Disney World, you'll know that that's Main Street in Disney. And you can see the similarity between Disney's American Main Street and the vision that he had back in Missouri. And when we get later to talk about the, the town of Celebration in Florida, we'll uh, talk about Main Street again. So uh, when Disney was young, back in 1911, the family moved from Marceline to Kansas City. And this is a picture of Walt and some of his friends. Uh, he was a newsboy and earned some extra cash in the early 1900s. But Walt's interest was in drawing. He loved to draw. And so when he got to adulthood, he attended the Art Institute of Chicago, where he uh, perfected his craft in drawing. And when he graduated from the Art Institute, he got a job in the Kansas City, in a Kansas City ad company. Uh, it was here in Kansas City that he met uh, a gentleman by the name of Oob Iwerks, whose name will pop up throughout Disney's career, who is his longest friend, who started business with him together, they had a falling out and got back together again. So Disney was kind of bored working in the uh, ad company and he said to his brother Roy, let's go into business ourselves. Uh, I think that uh, we can get into the business of making cartoons rather than making ads. So one of Disney's first characters was Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. And those of you who are of a particular age may remember Oswald Rabbit of cartoons in the movie theaters. And a lot of the Oswald Rabbit and other early Disney productions are available on YouTube that you could view uh, anytime. So um, Disney and Ub Iwerks worked together on Oswald and they were going to take this into their own business and they discovered that they didn't own the copyright. So 
they decided that they were going to have to move in another direction. Uh, in 1929, Oob and Walt worked together, uh, putting together a series of cartoons called Laughograms. And the Laughograms were short films that were based on uh, fairy tales. And again, you can find Laughograms uh, on YouTube. In 1923, Walt and Roy decided to open up their own cartoon studio. Uh, and uh, just you can see the original staff there. But over the years, Walt's staff grew to over a thousand working in the various production aspects uh, of the Disney Brothers co uh, company. And while he was at his own studio, Walt, ever the cartoonist, starting to come up with the idea of, you know who, Mickey Mouse. And if you take a good look at some of these early pictures of Walt, of Walt and particularly Mickey, you'll notice that some of the characteristics of Mickey Mouse and the early pictures are very similar to those of Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. So these are the, the two characters, Walt and the mouse that made him famous. Uh, Disney and Oob decided to put together their first sound cartoon in 1928 called Steamboat Willie. And I'm sure many of you over the years, if you didn't see it originally, have seen it on YouTube or on documentaries about the history of Disney Corp and Mickey Mouse. And uh, so Steamboat Willie is where it all began back in 1928. 10 of the early Mickey Mouse cartoons were nominated for Academy Awards. So they got to get the critical attention uh, besides earning some money. Uh, the early successes, as I said, were Steamboat Willie. Uh, another uh, color cartoon called Silly Symphony uh, and uh, a 1935 production of something called Band Concert, where Mickey Mouse is a conductor of a band made up of other early Disney characters. And uh, the public began to notice uh, the successes of Disney and his ability to entertain and his unique flair for his cartoons. And so you begin to find Disney on the cover of Time Magazine, not the first time uh, that he will be on the cover of this important uh, magazine, but uh, this is just, just the beginning. In 1939, the company was, was successful and Disney said, you know what, we need to move to California. So they packed up Mickey Mouse and all of his friends and moved to a 55 acre site in Burbank. And after they unpacked, they actually put together the very first animated full length feature film, which was Fantasia again, featuring Mickey Mouse. And uh, although they were very happy with the production values, uh, Fantasia did not get a lot of critical positive reviews. Uh, for some odd reason, the critics didn't like it. They didn't like the relationship of the characters and the music, but this was a big step in having a full length feature film. The Disney studio today looks nothing like the Disney studio of the 1930s. You can see uh, the modern building and those are the seven dwarfs who are holding up the pillars um, of the building. And aside from the films, Disney started to get into the comic book business. And I'm telling you, if you check your attic or basement, if you have a basement, um, and see if you have any of these old Walt Disney comics, you might have something that's worth quite a bit of money. Uh, the, the picture on the left is the very first Mickey Mouse uh, comic book. And there have been hundreds ever since. The Mickey Mouse cartoon comic books and books were translated into many languages. This is El Raton Miguelito. And, uh, and it's in, you'll find it in Spanish and in Italian and many, many other languages. In 1934, Mickey was one of the first inflatable balloons that was used in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in New York City. And so you can see that uh, Mickey was getting national attention and was very popular. In 1941, and this is a pivotal moment, there was a nine week strike of cartoonists at the Disney Corporation, which actually held up production of some of his major full length cartoon works. It was at this particular time 
that Disney began to get a distrust and disdain for unionists and communists. And that's something that you'll see recurring in Walt's history as dislike for communists, dislike for socialists, uh, because among other reasons, uh, it um, disrupted his business. But after the strike was over, the company got back to work and the first full length uh, feature film in cartoon form that came after that was the 1942 work Bambi, which I'm sure many of you um, are familiar with. And as I said before, because of this disdain for, for communists and socialists from 1940 until his passing, Walt was a secret informer for the Los Angeles office of the FBI and he was befriended by J. Edgar Hoover. A lot of this is discussed in uh, this book I just posted here on the right called Walt Disney's Hollywood's Dark Prince. And of course, even after World War II, uh, Disney was asked and he was happy to volunteer to address a congressional session of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Now we come to World War II and Disney changes his focus uh, on what the studio was going to do during the war. Uh, the market for his films in Europe with the outbreak of the war has dried up. So Walt said, the war turned our studio into a military reservation. All facilities were devoted to making films for the war effort, insignia for submarines, planes, ships, and tanks, training films for the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Well, at that time, it was the Army Air Corps, but later became the United States Air Force. So those of you who are World War II vets, or those of you who had fathers or, uh, who were World War II vets, uh, their insignia patches from their outfits may have been designed by Walt Disney and his company. Uh, there are two great books to take a look at if you're interested in delving into Disney and his role during World, II, World War II, one called Disney During World War II, which has lots of uh, illustrations, and a more recent book, Service with Character, the Disney Studio and, and World War II. So you can really get a look at what Disney did during the war effort. Um, Victory Through Air Power was probably one of the most popular um, documentary films that Disney made for the war effort. And he also made a number of um, documentary industrial training films for the military. This one is for flush riveting. In addition to making uh, training films, uh, Disney helped to raise funds uh, by through the War Finance Committee and by promoting through his characters buying uh, war bonds. And Walt decided to put all of his characters to work and a number of comics and cartoons that came out during the war uh, show Disney's characters helpful in the war effort. And here's a great picture of Disney's characters marching to victory. Just everyone, Mickey Mouse, the Seven Dwarfs, Donald Duck, they're all in military regalia to help out to win the war. But I wanna call your attention to one particular film that won an Academy Award in 1943 for best animated film, but was so controversial that it was never so shown after the war. The, the film is called, the cartoon is called The Fuhrer's Face. And for the first six and a half minutes of the film, Donald Duck is portrayed as a Nazi in Germany doing work for Hitler. It is only at the end of the movie that it is revealed that um, it was a dream and that Donald loves to be in America. There are pictures of him dressed as Uncle Sam, pictures of uh, the Statue of Liberty and red, white, and blue all over the place. But it got a lot of critical pans and concerns. And, and this is one of the things that caused some people to say, well, Walt Disney might be an anti-Semite, but that wasn't the case at least with, with this film. Uh, and uh, if you are interested in seeing, and, and I would recommend you take a look at and uh, come to your own conclusions, again, The Fuhrer's Face is available on YouTube. The film's original title was Donald Duck in Nazi-Land. And uh, as I said, it was quite controversial and not shown very much after the war. There was a, a song 
that came out of that movie that was almost as popular as Who Was Afraid of the, the Big Bad Wolf. And it's called The Fuhrer's Face. And this is a picture of a, a cover of the sheet music uh, for the film. Again, it, it was meant to be propaganda, but it caused all kinds of problems uh, for Disney. Walt decided that as much as he wanted to do for the war effort, he did not want to make any profit from any of the work he did for the government for World War II. He kept his people working. Um, there were federal government security guards outside of the Burbank studio, but Walt did not make a dime from the work that he did during World War II. Now, <clears throat> we come to the post-war effort, and one of the first movies that Walt produces after World War II is Song of the South. Now, Song of the South rose a lot of controversy, particularly with the NAACP. They said that this film was an insult to the black community. And even now, uh, there has been a lot of criticism. And if you take a look at the Disney archives of DVDs that have made, been made public that you can buy, this one was never made into a DVD uh, because of the way that blacks are portrayed in this movie and the slaves are portrayed in this movie. Uh, it is well, today totally inappropriate. And even now you'll, you'll hear various organizations saying that, uh, that this film should, should not be shown anywhere. And it really wasn't until the year 2000 that Disney made, I thought, made amends and addressed the issue of segregation and racism with uh, the film uh, with Denzel Washington, Remember the Titans. If, and this is a film, if you're interested in sports, if you're interested in racial equality, it's a great film to rent uh, and, and to view. Basically, it's a, it's a true story of a black football coach who was hired to coach football in a recently integrated high school in uh, Virginia. And uh, great poignant moments in there. And I would recommend that you uh, take a look at this film, Remember the Titans, if you haven't already seen it. But Biz Disney wasn't satisfied with just making cartoons and just making com comic books. He decided to head his company in other directions. So in 1956, they established the Disney Music Group to produce records, not just of uh, records of songs from Disney movies, but other records as well. And of course, the first big hit from a Disney Music Group was Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf, which was the most popular song from the Disney classic, Three Little Pigs. But that was just the beginning. Another hit that came out of Disney music was, uh, for those of you who have a, are of a certain age will remember the Ballad of Davy Crockett, born on a mountaintop in Tennessee. This was another bestseller uh, for the Disney company. So now you can see we're going to, from black and white cartoons, to color cartoons, to full length cartoons, to movies, and now we're expanding into uh, the music area. In 1955, Walt decides to, to realize a lifelong dream and bring his characters to life by building a theme park centered uh, around his characters. So Disneyland in Anaheim, California opened on July 17th, 1955. At, at that time, the princely cost of $17 million. So it was deemed the happiest place on earth. It was extremely popular. And within five years um, of its opening, they were getting millions of people a year coming to Disneyland to, to see what uh, Walt had concocted. Here's a picture of uh, Walt signing autographs at Disneyland. He was a quite popular guy. And for a part of the time, he built an apartment on top of the firehouse in Disneyland and he and his wife uh, lived, lived there from time to time. With the success of Disneyland, Walt decided to go to the next great frontier, television. And he wanted to tap into the untapped audience of baby boomers. Television in the 1950s was becoming very popular. In the post-war era, almost every home had to have one. So Walt decided, why not cash in? And at that time, 
his most successful program, which aired every day from 1954 to 1957, was the Mickey Mouse Club. And I'm sure some of you out there uh, this afternoon watched the show religiously or were members of the Mickey Mouse Club. It's kind of interesting when I take a look at this and, and, and see where Walt is going culturally and, and take a look at the Mouseketeers. And if I were there with you in person, I would ask the question, what do you notice about the Mouseketeers? And you could probably see and determine that all of the Mouseketeers are white. There are no black Mouseketeers. There are no Asian Mouseketeers in this group. And there are, there are no Latino Mous Mouseketeers. So this was the audience that Disney was aiming for in the 1950s. Probably the most famous Mouseketeer was Annette Funicello. She was the most popular and um, left the Mouseketeers earlier than a lot of suspected because in more than one way, Annette outgrew the Mouseketeers. So she ended up doing a series of beach films with Frankie Avalon and her career went in another uh, other direction. But those of you who were early watchers of the Mickey Mouse Club uh, will probably remember Annette. Beyond that, Disney also decided to take advantage of the Sunday night family night on television. This is well before Sunday night football. And he created the wonderful world of color. So he would use portions of his movies, create film just for this TV show, and of course, use it to promote Disneyland, getting people to want to come to Disneyland. 1954, Walt again was featured on the cover of a Time magazine, uh, to Enchanted Worlds on Electronic Wings, uh, telling the, the nation and anyone who would read about the, not only successes of his cartoons, but the animation success of Walt Disney Studios. In 1957, on, on, on November 12th, uh, Disney became a public company. Uh, the ticker symbol is DIS. Uh, the current stock price, and I didn't check it this morning, is somewhere between $129 and $130 a share. And if you were fortunate enough to buy it back then, you have yourself quite a handsome profit. For those of you who are interested, I happen to collect antique stock certificates. This stock certificate is very valuable because they stopped making these. And so it has become a collector's item. Um, I got this off of the internet. Um, I don't own any of the old certificates, but I wish I did. Disney decided that he wanted to get into the education field as well. So in 1959, he produced this film called Donald Duck in Mathematic Land, which uses Donald to portray some basic mathematics skills. What I find kind of funny about this is that in 1970, when I first started teaching, my first teaching assignment was fifth grade mathematics. And I decided I was going to give the students a treat and show Donald Duck in Mathematic Land. So I get the film and I show it. And the students said, oh, Mr. Margolis, this is fifth graders. We've already seen this film three times. So elementary school teachers all over the country had taken advantage of uh, this particular film and used it probably until it got worn out. Um, in 1964, uh, there were groups of people who were designing the World's Fair in New York. And again, those of you who, who lived in that part of the country might remember going to the 1964 World's Fair. So he was asked to come up with some of the designs and use some of the animatronics for some of the uh, exhibits at the World's Fair. This is Walt and some of the representatives from General Electric designing the Progress Land exhibit that was uh, at the, the New York World's Fair. Um, he was also asked to design the Illinois Land of Lincoln exhibit. And those of you who have been to Disney World in recent years will know that this picture of Abraham Lincoln is part of the Hall of the Presidents and Disney used his skills in animatronics, the Disney company, to create a walking and talking and movable uh, Lincoln, uh, Abraham Lincoln. And so this is something he used in 64, but you'll see ended up in Disney World uh, at the Hall of the Presidents. Another item that was in the 64 World's Fair uh, was the exhibit called It's a Small World, which is made up of dolls from all over the world. 
you get in a little flat boat and you go in this canal and you see Dahl singing the song, It's a Small World After All, uh, in different languages as you go through the exhibit. This has become a very popular exhibit at both Disneyland and Disney World. And a little aside, um, the very first time I took our daughter, we took our daughter to Disney World. It happened to be on Christmas Day, which was a mistake I could go into later because that happens to be the most crowded day of the year. And she wanted to go on the It's a Small World ride first. So we stood in line, we got in, took the ride. It was very, it was very enjoyable. We get off, we have a whole theme park to see. And our daughter goes, can we go on this again, daddy? So we did. And I think we were singing It's a Small World for months after that particular event. Um, Disney began to increase its holdings. A lot of the holdings that we have come to know involved with Disney took place after Disney's death in 1966. But again, expanding Disney's reach and expanding his ability to have an interface with what is middle-class America and what constitutes middle-class values. In 1995, Disney bought ABC Television Network. Now, this is one of the three major TV networks, four if you include Fox, but of the three main uh, television networks, ABC is one of them. So now they have a, a TV station that broadcasts news as well as entertainment programming. So now Disney is in the news business uh, as well and the informational business as well as the entertainment business. They also purchased ESPN, which was the first 24-hour sports network. And then, of course, they created Disney Channel, which is the cable channel that caters to uh, Disney works only. Oops, let's see here, going the wrong way. And some of the shows that end up on the Disney Channel, if you have kids or grandkids, they'll probably be able to relate to High School Musical and Hannah Montana. The other holdings over the years that have increased, and some of these logos and companies will be familiar to you, um, Touchstone Pictures, uh, Walt Disney Motion Picture Studios, Films, and Buena Vista. Uh, and then again, the buying spree began in the two, 2000s. In, 19, excuse me, in 2004, Disney Company buys The Muppets, another iconic children's program. In 2006, Disney acquires Pixar Animation Studios and all of their holdings for $7.4 billion. In 2009, for $4 billion, the Marvel Studios with all of the Marvel cartoon characters, and now that becomes part of the Disney uh, ensemble as well. And in 2012, uh, the licensing rights to all of the Star Wars films. And in 2019, most recently, Hulu, one of the streaming, streaming services. But let's take a look and backtrack here and take a look on family values uh, and what's important as far as early Disney was concerned. This is an article that was written by Walt Disney's daughter back in 1956 showing the family man that he was. And by the way, Disney loved trains and he had a model railroad besides the one at the park uh, at his house as well. So the question we want to take a look at and continue to take a look at is Disney, by virtue of what they own and what they do, exerting influence on what constitutes American culture. So these are typical Disney families. Are these typical of what is America or what typical of what Disney wants America to be? Just something for you to think about. Uh, in some of his early uh, cartoons, he deals with issues of love. And in uh, Dumbo, it's okay to be different. The virtue of honesty in Pinocchio, youth with Peter Pan. And now we get to the issue of the Disney princesses. Now there's been an evolution of Disney princesses over the years, but in the beginning, all of the Disney princesses were white. The original Disney princesses were Snow White, Cinderella, and Belle from Beauty and the Beast. 
and is only more recently with some of the uh, Disney characters that have been created for more recent films that we begin to see a diversity in the characters. Uh, we have the character here from um, Aladdin, Jasmine, Princess Jasmine, who is Middle Eastern. It's a good picture of Jasmine from 1992. In 1998, we have the uh, main character hero of Mulan, uh, an Asian princess character. In 2016, more recently, um, Moana, which, who is uh, Polynesian. And I don't know where you would classify Ariel from The Little Mermaid, uh, but again, one of Disney's princess characters. Of course, with the uh, production of Frozen, which started out as a cartoon movie and ended up on Broadway, uh, we go back to Princess Anna from Arendelle in, the, in Europe, and we go back to a, a white princess a, as well. And of course, uh, the most popular song to come out of this was the song, Let It Go. Uh, this, if you have grandkids, you probably have heard this song uh, quite a few times. And if you take your grandkids to Disney World with advanced reservations, for only $250, your child or grandchild can be a princess for a day. For that money, you get to dress up in a princess costume, get to meet the princesses and have tea with one of the Disney princesses. <clears throat> Walt's brother, Roy, was responsible for merchandising Mickey Mouse. And so from the early collectible stuffed animals to putting Mickey and other characters on practically everything, uh, that was Roy's responsibility and marketing Disney uh, items to kids, not just at the theme parks, in department stores, and in company owned Disney stores. This is a, an early picture here of Roy uh, and some of the, the things that he developed merchandising Mickey Mouse, not just in the United States, <clears throat> but around the world. Uh, Disney also, the Disney company has experimented with trying to mix history uh, and their animation and tried to do that with uh, the animated film Pocahontas. And if you knew anything about American history, you know that he took some license, the company took some license with this successful film. But Disney was also very adept, the Disney company, at creating heroes. Uh, this is Zorro. Guy Williams plays Zero, uh, Zero on uh, TV and in the movies. And of course, made a star out of Fess Parker who played Davy Crockett, the king of the wild frontier. Uh, Johnny Tremaine, who was a, a hero in the American Revolutionary time. And he also created, the company created animated heroes, Buzz Lightyear, Simba, and Aladdin. Unfortunately, Disney passed away on December 15th, 1966. He was 65 years old. Did not get to see a lot of the things that we saw of what has evolved from his original work. And probably the biggest thing is that Disney never got to see the opening of Walt Disney World. So the Disney company had to pick up after Walt's death and the first film that was released uh, after his death in 1967 was Jungle Book. But even before Walt passed away, he created a company called the MT Lot Real Estate Company. And the MT Lot Real Estate Company went to Orlando and started buying up land um, clandestinely, not telling anybody what they had in mind and using the obviously fictitious name. Uh, in time, they ended up acquiring 27,000 acres of land, which is twice the size of Manhattan, in the area of Florida that was eventually going to become Walt Disney World. And so we have the Magic Kingdom invading Florida. The Magic Kingdom in Orlando, or Kissimmee, opened on October 1st, 1971. 
And uh, Mickey Mouse became Florida's best known citizen. And Disney World had become one of the best known tourist attractions in the United States and around the world. And of course, one of Florida's biggest tourist attractions. In addition to Disney World, uh, there were several other theme parks that were created on the same property. There's Ex Ex Epcot, excuse me, the experimental prototype community of tomorrow, which the company envisioned of being a permanent World's Fair. Um, if those of you attended my lecture several years ago on whatever happened to the World's Fair, this is one of the things that happens why there are no longer any World's Fairs in the United States. There are in Europe and elsewhere, but this was one of the things I think that led to the demise of World's Fairs in the US, which was kind of interesting because if you go back to 64, what was an integral part of what happened in New York? There was Disney Hollywood Studios, which was also on the ground. And the fourth theme park, which is the most recent, is Animal Kingdom with uh, lots of live animals where you can go on a mini safari. And last year, uh, the Toy Story Land, based on the Disney animated cartoon, Toy Story 1, 2, 3, and I think 4, uh, which just opened uh, last year. So in addition to theme parks, in addition to selling merchandising and movies and cartoons, Disney is the world's largest publisher of children's books and magazines uh, throughout the world. Another opportunity uh, to create their image of values. Disney also purchased Hyperion Press, which is a mainstream book company located in New York, and the Disney Magazine. The original magazine, if you go back far enough, Walt, the, the uh, Mickey Mouse Club had a magazine back in the 50s, but this is the more recent ideation uh, of Disney Magazine. In 1983, uh, with even despite what, all that was going on, uh, Disney company was not in very good financial straits. So they hired Michael Eisner to take over the company and try to straighten the ship. So here you can see in this, uh, again, cover of Time Magazine, uh, an article about how Michael Eisner was been able to transform Disney into a $3 billion company. What did Eisner do? Created elegant grand hotels on the property. Um, established the Disney Cruise Line. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, the cruise line has temporarily been suspended, but had been popular with families uh, for ever since its existence. Um, <clears throat> Eisner also created the Disney Institute, which started as a management institute where you could take your, your employees for a week intensive on how Disney does it, what makes Disney successful and what their management style is. If any of you are familiar with the book In Search of Excellence, which uh, takes a look at how some of America's best run companies are run, there is a major chapter, several chapters about Disney and how successful Disney was in running a company. So uh, I don't know what's happened to the Disney Institute as a result of the pandemic, but you could sign up and go to Orlando for a week and take one of these intensive courses in management style. At one time, the Disney company owned two professional sports teams. They've divested since from both of them. One was the Anaheim Angels, an American League baseball team, and the other, uh, the Anaheim Mighty Ducks, which is a team in the National Hockey League. So again, attracting different audiences, uh, American cultural icon audiences, baseball more than hockey, but again, attracting a larger audience to a diverse, following. <clears throat> Opening up Disney stores in malls to again expand for people who couldn't get to Disney World or Disneyland or, or wanted a, a larger offering of uh, memorabilia than were offered in some of the department stores. Um, these are Disney dollars. I, I, I kid that they even printed their own money, but basically these are gift certificates. So you can go to Disney and buy these and send them to family members and they're spendable at any of the Disney parks and also at the Disney stores. And they've also become collectible. Now, back in 1994, 
um, Eisner and the Disney Company decided they would like to uh, operate a historically based theme park in Virginia. And it was going to be based on elements of US history. This park never got off the ground because the land that they were trying to acquire was adjacent to a Civil War battlefield. And there was such a public outcry for people who felt that it would be sacrilegious to put a Disney park next to a Civil War battlefield. And also there were concerns about the increase in traffic congestion and construction around the area that they were successful in opposing this project that never got built. Now, Eisner says, well, what area have we not conquered? What can we do uh, to expand our horizons and get to additional audiences? So he came up with the idea of why not having Disney presence on Broadway? So uh, back in the 1990s, Disney decides to come to Broadway, but he does it, excuse me, in a uh, clandestine manner. Uh, let's go here. Mike Eisner and Mayor Rudy Giuliani had secret talks about bringing Disney Company to, to New York. And basically Michael Eisner said, look, Mayor Giuliani, if you clean up 42nd Street from all of the crime and prostitution and all of this graffiti and stuff on 42nd Street, we will buy a theater and, and use it to have Broadway shows. So uh, Giuliani agreed, cleaned up 42nd Street, and he lived up to his end of the bargain, and Eisner lived up to his end of the bargain. They purchased the Amsterdam Theater, and from that point be began a barrage of Disney shows on Broadway. 1944, Beauty and the Beast opens in New York and becomes extremely successful. 1997, Lion King comes to Broadway, still running but before all of Broadway shut down. And Mary Poppins. Uh, other Disney shows that came to Broadway were Aladdin and Aida. And there are plans for more when Broadway reopens for other Brit Disney shows to uh, take the plunge and come as well. So having made the transition now to mainstream media with ABC, the sports networks, sports teams, the theme parks, the music, the films, Disney company said, let's go ultimate, let's build a community that's based on Disney values. And I call it the Disneyfication of America. They call it celebration. If you ever drive to Walt Disney World and you drive up I-75 and get on I-4, right before you get to the exit for Disney World is the exit off of I-4 for Celebration. Celebration is a completely planned town uh, that was created by the Disney Corporation, not just for, um, for visitors, but for full-time residents. So uh, this is uh, a, an aerial view and the town of Celebration opened on November 18th, 1995. It happened to be Mickey Mouse's birthday, appropriately enough. It's laid out and it has its own hospital. It has its own branch campus of a college and it has its own school system with a Disney created curriculum, not just studying Disney characters, but its entire curriculum is based on certain American values. And when the school system opened, the Disney company made a nationwide search for teachers and administrators who fit their goal of what they wanted to have taught in that school district. Uh, these next two pictures I wanted to show you are the main street. And again, goes back to Walt's belief and his feeling of the importance of mainstream America and the importance of small town main streets, just like in Marceline, in Missouri, just like Main Street in Disneyland and Disney World. This is Main Street in Celebration. And here's another a view of Main Street in Celebration, which is a neat little street to walk down. It's an open community. You can drive through Celebration. You, you can stop and have lunch there. You can drive through some of the neighborhoods and see what the town looks like. Now, one of the issues 
that came up over the years of Eisner's uh, ownership or his running of the company was the gay community and its relationship with Disney. Um, the great gay pride organization decided to have a gay pride day at Disney World. In the beginning, it was not sanctioned by the Disney company. They just got together on their own and came to Disney. A number of evangelical churches were very upset that Disney was allowing this, not sanctioning this, but allowing these folks to come. And they were encouraging their uh, constituents to boycott Disney. Well, the gay pride program at Disney became so successful that the Disney company decided to have an actual gay pride day at Disney World. So it went from just a few people from this is a, a major event uh, again, showing Disney's diversity and uh, expansion of what it considered to be uh, values. Having conquered the United States, Disney decided to export Disneyfication overseas and began opening Disneyland's in other countries. Uh, this is, uh, these are some photos of Disneyland in um, Tokyo. And Disneyland Paris, originally called Euro Disney, uh, this was a flop and it was closed for a while and reopened. A lot of um, Parisians and a lot of French resented the fact that Disney was trying to import American culture and, and influence uh, French culture. So it is open now. I don't know currently if it's open because of the virus, but it had been closed for a while and then reopened and reconfigured. The most recent Disney opening was in Shanghai, the Disney Shanghai Resort. And uh, it was opened in 2016. So people have, who have seen this before said, well, what about the Disney characters? What about their influence? And they said, what's the relationship between Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse? So I did some reading and according to Disney lore, even though they've never been married on screen, supposedly Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse are married off screen, but they're uh, boyfriend and girlfriend in all of the Mi Mickey and Minnie Mouse cartoons. So you can take that for what's, what it's worth, uh, but they've been friends for 90 years. Uh, and the question then, if you're gonna say that about Mickey Mouse, what about Donald and Daisy Duck? Don't have an answer for them. And also, if you follow Disney comics, what about, excuse me, Huey, Dewey, and Dewey, who, uh, who are Donald's nephews? I've never seen their mother, and I've never seen their father. So I really don't know, you know, what about these guys? Um, to kind of draw some conclusions here and, and uh, sum up before we open up to, to uh, some questions, um, Walt Disney has a Hollywood Walk of Fame star, and rightly deserved. And there is a Disney Family Museum that was opened in San Francisco in 2009. This museum is not run by the Walt Disney Company, it's run by the family. So you'll find different artifacts here and you'll probably find a different spin on Walt um, and his life if you go to this museum. Oh, excuse me. Uh, this is Bob Chapak. He's the current CEO of the Disney Corporation. And his job is to running this behemoth corporation now and getting things uh, rolling, uh, dealing with the pandemic. Um, and back in 1968, Walt Disney was honored with a United States Postal Service uh, commemorative. Those of you who collect stamps may know about this. And Disney characters have been portrayed and honored on postage stamps, not just here in the United States, but all around the world. And in 2018, Time Life Magazine published a souvenir retrospective of, of Walt and all of his accomplishments uh, over the years. So ladies and gentlemen, never forget that all of this started with a mouse. And a quote here from Walt, coverage is the main quality of leadership. And in my opinion, it usually implies some risk. In reviewing his life and the life of the Disney Corporation, it's obvious that they did take some risks. Some were successful and others weren't. 
So I leave you this, this question uh, to open it up. Does Disney have influence on American uh, middle-class values? And I thank you for listening in and uh, I hope I can answer some of your questions. Okay, I'm gonna stop your sharing and uh, we'll get, uh, get into a gallery view and ask everybody to unmute themselves and anybody have any questions they'd like to pose to, uh, <coughs> to Jeff? Yes. Uh, go ahead. I would like to know how you got started to do all of this. Were you a Disney fan when you were a child? Um, I used to watch the Mickey Mouse Club religiously. Um, uh, and of course, I got interested in Disney when our daughter was young and we, would, we took her to Disney World. But the whole issue about Disney uh, and uh, American culture, uh, I used to teach at Rowan University in Glassboro, New Jersey in the College of Education. And it was there that I met Henry Giroux and learned about his book. And uh, I got a copy of his book and began to reading it. And I tried to start putting the pieces of the puzzle together. So that's the interest has been over you know, a number of years. I'm still interested in what's, what's going on with Disney. I'm anxious to see how they recover uh, from uh, the pandemic and where they go heading forward. They've had a Anybody else have a question? Yeah. Uh, Dick, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, Jeff, uh, Steve McCloskey, where do you see Disney in, say, the next 15, 20 years? Wow. Uh, if, uh, if I knew the answer to that, I would ask to be on the board of trustees. But I think, you know, you raise a really good question, Steve, because based on what's happening in America now with you know, issues of identity and cultural diversity, I really think that, that Disney has to make uh, more of an effort to broaden its scope and become more inclusive. You know, we've come a long way from an all white Mouseketeers and understanding the missteps with some oh, right. you know, heading down the road. Uh, they need to be more inclusive of who they are and where they want to go. Uh, also, I have no idea of what they want to do outside of the United States because they, they've met with a modicum of success uh, in, in Tokyo, less so in Paris, more so in Shanghai. So I don't know, you know where they're going uh, from there. But they, they certainly have opportunity. They have the clout. And, and again, because if, if I take away everything else, and, and, and full disclosure, I happen to be a member of the Board of Trustees of the Naples Press Club. Um, they have a big deal with the ownership of ABC Network. They, because they're one of the big three networks and, and David Muir who does the nightly news for them does a fantastic job um, and is a mainstream organization. They're a unique role there to, to play a role. Right? It'd be interesting to see how they, how they cover the election, how they cover current events because when I see ABC, I think in the back of my head, that's Disney. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, we'll have to see what happens down the road. But at the very least, Steve, they need to be more inclusive and make a, a wider tent for more people. Talk a little bit about the book that you just published. Uh, yes. Um, I just finished publishing a book I don't know if I can get it back on the screen, called The President's Pen. Now, for those of you who attended my lecture at your organization last year, you'll know that the topic was about presidential literature, books written by US presidents. And usually people have the book first before they go and, and make the presentation. But I was still doing research and the publishing of uh, the book was a little behind schedule. And uh, so I didn't have the book to promote. And again, because of the, the pandemic and issues with the publishing company, the book just came out two weeks ago. So it's called The President's Pen. It's 150 pages that takes a look at the writings of 16 US presidents, uh, starting with John Adams and going up to and including Donald Trump. Uh, the book is available online at Amazon. Uh, you can order it by going to my website, which is presidentspen.com. 
That's presidentspen.com. You can order the book from Amazon there. And um, if you do get a copy, and if you do in the future uh, would like to have it autographed, at the time when we can all get together, it would be my pleasure and an honor to do that for you. So uh, Dick, thank you for letting me uh, uh, plug that. And hopefully uh, some of you will have an interest in, you can read about the book at the website. And if you wish to purchase it, certainly can do that. For those of you uh, men's club members who were at Jeff's presentation last year, uh, you'll recall it was an encore presentation. Uh, the first time Jeff had intended to make that presentation, he got suddenly ill and had a walk away from the lunch and uh, he was kind enough to come back uh, at a later date and give the presentation, which uh, was a rousing success. So I think we're all looking forward to the book, Jeff. Thank you. Okay, well, well, thank you for having me this afternoon. And it's our pleasure. Thank you. Thank hey, you, Jeff, for doing it. It was very, very interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Okay, great. Anybody else? If not, we'll uh, conclude the meeting and uh, I'll end the meeting. Thanks for all attending. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.